So you all know that I like to play the piano and I love to sing. I took piano lessons right through grade 12. I got my grade two theory and my grade eight piano at that time. I don't play like that now anymore. I don't think I, prob I probably could anymore, but I've really enjoyed it. I've been so glad that I, that I did that. I started playing piano in church when I was in my early teens, and I've been singing as far back as I can remember. Some of my earliest memories of a child, as a child, a young, very young child, are singing together as we had family devotions together. Uh, another very early memory was that Janine and I were supposed to sing at a Father's Day service at our church. Uh, we, were ve we were very young. Janine chickened out the last minute, and so I sang by myself. Janine and I sang a lot together over the years. Dad would play his guitar and we would sing at different churches. We would sing at the, the old folks' home in Bancroft. Um, Sheldon sometimes would join with us. And then later on, uh, Dwayne and I and Janine and Bob sang together. Those were good years. I really enjoyed that. I had dreams, kids. I had dreams of being famous. When I was 18, I had the special privilege of singing in Handel's Messiah in a great big choir. And that was, maybe for some of you, would, it, it was amazing. It was really amazing. I sing alto. I have a low voice. And, so, and I hear the harmony notes in my head. When I, as, we, as we sing the melody line, I can hear that. And I love the sounds of harmony. And when I was singing in the Messiah, it was amazing. The voices that were there in that big church with the band, it was, it was amazing. And it sounds really good when you can harmonize together. But when you sing the wrong notes, it sounds harsh. And it doesn't sound right. And same with the piano. When I make a big blunder and play the wrong chord, it can sound really bad. It clashes. Those, those notes don't go together and it doesn't harmonize. And I, I thought of it just as we were at church here this morning, Dwayne and I were tuning his guitar. And you could hear that something was just a little bit off. And it took us a little bit longer this morning to get that gu guitar in tune so that it sounded right. The last few weeks we've been talking about being community together, being the church of Jesus Christ. When we commit our lives to Jesus, we become part of that big family of all who follow Jesus. We still live in the world, but we're also part of the kingdom of God. And life in the kingdom of God looks different in lots of ways from the ways of the world. The way we talk, the way we act, the way we treat people, the way we do business. Many things will change as we reflect who we are in Jesus Christ. When we saw last week that Jesus said that people would know we belong to him by the way we love each other. And it goes not only just how we love each other, but our love grows and spreads out to other groups and to other people as well. We talked about encouraging one another and how important it is to mutually encourage and support each other. We saw that encouraging someone can even change that person's life. Today we're going to talk about another one another. And that is to live in harmony with one another how we get along with each other. And please believe me as I go through these, I'm not speaking on these because this is what I think there's something wrong with us and that we need to change. I'm speaking of these because these are important and they, we talk about them in the Bible lots and lots. And uh, so, so we, we all can grow and learn as we go through them. It's how we get along with each other. Harmony has to do with our unity with each other and it's hard. If you look at the many denominations in Christian faith, you see how hard it is for us to get along. The church was born at Pentecost with many different churches, house churches in many different places, and they were all connected to the home church in Jerusalem. And then from Jerusalem, that base was moved to Rome. In 1054, the church split into two major groups, two major branches, the Western Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church. Each group excommunicated the other branch over religious practices, religious authority, and theology. Two of, two of the differences I want to mention. One of them was the language in, used in church services, and another one was, was whether priests could be married. These were very important issues to them at that time, to both sides. And as you can see, splits continue to happen today. Look at, at the different Mennonite groups. 
there's been dis disagreement about language uh, years ago in, in Mennonite churches. There's been disagreements about music. There, what does it mean not to be a part of the world? And there are groups that have really grappled with that and being part of the world include things like your clothing, what you wore, whether you were going to have electricity in your house and on your farm, whether you were going to drive a car with rubber tires. It included things like dancing and alcohol and smoking. It included, in our circles back where we lived, it included head coverings and whether a woman was allowed to cut her hair or not. Some of those things can sound very trivial. And you wonder why. But splits come as people disagree with one another. And in often they split because they believe that they are keeping themselves holy before God with splitting away from the group that they were with. Churches have left our MC SAS conference. And people have left our own church here because of differences in the ways of seeing things. It was important enough for them to leave. But unity among Christian, among Christ followers, is very important. Peter says, finally, all of you, live in harmony with one another. Be sympathetic. Love as brothers and sisters. Be compassionate and humble. That's 1 Peter 3.8. Paul writes a letter to the church in Corinth because of divisions that they have. They've divided themselves up between three very strong leaders, supporting different things between these very strong leaders. And then there's a fourth group that just piously says, I follow Christ. Paul won't have anything to do with it. He says, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another, so that there may be no divisions among you, and that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. 1 Corinthians 1.10, that's pretty strong language. It says it pretty clearly, doesn't it? And in his letter, he talks to them about some of the things that were dividing them, with sexuality and marriage, lawsuits among believers, and food offered to idols. And he gives them some guidance in those things. And then Jesus. Before he dies, what is on Jesus' heart? He prays. What is on his heart? Well, he prays for himself, he prays for his disciples, and then he prays for all of us. That all of them may be one Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. That's John 17, 21. What does Jesus pray for before he dies? He prays for unity. He prays that we may be one. Why is that so important to Jesus? And I believe, again, it's because it comes out of the very heart of the Trinity, of who the Trinity is, that God the Father, God the Son, the God the Holy Spirit, as one together. May they be one, Father, just as you are in me, and I am in you. So with all the church disagreements and splits, past and present, and with how hard it is to be united, yet how important, Jesus says, it is for us to be in agreement and harmony and united together, how can we get along? And I don't have all the answers, but we're going to look at a few of them in Scripture this morning. And believe me, there, what I am sharing, there is so much more that could be said as well. And I want to look at Romans 12. I was going to start um, later in the chapter, but I'm going to start at verses 1 and 2 because I think it's important that Paul starts right there in chapter 12. And Paul urges Christ's followers to offer our bodies as living sacrifices to God. Offer ourselves totally and completely to Jesus. That's first. Because of what God has done for us in Jesus Christ, there's no other response we can give than to give ourselves totally and completely back to him. And he goes on to say, don't conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And I believe that new life in the kingdom of God happens to us people as we become transformed more and more, as our minds are renewed, as we are changed from the patterns of the world 
to the patterns that Jesus taught us. Continues as we, as it happens as we continue to offer ourselves to God. Living what Jesus has taught and opening ourselves to the Holy Spirit to work in our lives. And Paul goes on in that section to talk about how important each one of us is as part of the body of Christ. He says that together we form one body and that we all have different gifts. Then he goes on to say, love must be sincere. And I don't know, I, didn't, I don't think I've, I noticed this quite the same way, but I've started noticing just over the last few weeks how much love is mentioned in relation to the ways we are supposed to live. We encourage each other because we love each other and because we love Jesus. It seems like love comes first. If we love God, then we're going to love each other. And then these other characteristics like unity and like encouragement are going to follow. Like Jesus, Paul makes love for other people, people the central focus of his exhortation. So what does sincerely love look like? And it continues down. And if you want to look at it further after church, I'm just going to hit on a few verses here. But there's a whole section there of what, he, what sincere love looks like. He says, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Honor one another above yourselves. So be devoted. Be devoted means to, ex, ex, uh, to extend the same care, the same kindness towards one another as we would in our biological family when our biological family is getting along the very best. In love, we put others ahead of ourselves. I remember when we got the new carpet and the new paint here in our church. So who decides the colors? Who decides the kind of paint, the color of paint? Churches split over decisions like this. And we looked at different samples. Some of us liked one color or one sample better than another. But we came to an agreement, and you know, this says something about that agreement because I'm not even sure how we came to that agreement. But as far as I know, there weren't any hard feelings. No one was resentful about the decision. It seemed that we were devoted to one another in love, and we honored one another as we made a decision. We were considerate of each other, and we didn't demand our own way. I think that's pretty special. So what else does sincere love look like? Well, in verse 16, Paul writes, live in harmony with one another. And a you is, is automatically there at the beginning of a verse like that. You live in harmony with one another. Not just those you agree with, not those who have the same opinion as you, but live in harmony. Live in harmony, that phrase, literally means have the same mind, be like-minded, be of one mind. Now that doesn't mean that we are going to all be robots exactly the same, having the same opinion. There's a beauty in diversity. There will be differences of opinion and sometimes there will be strong differences of opinion. So what's really important? What separates us from the world? What are things we can't let come between us as Christ followers? serving the same Lord. And some things will. We're supposed to consider the opinion of one another as people we love, people we value. I want you to imagine singing again. When different voices sing the melody, the alto, the tenor, and the bass, you hear four different notes. And I got thinking, that could be like four different opinions. But when you're singing, there's harmony together. And out of the four comes something greater, something beautiful. There was a song I was listening to, and I would have loved to have shared it this morning. I just didn't feel there was time. It was called One Voice. Uh, 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 Welling, um, I can't even remember his name now, but uh, it starts with one voice, and then you have the next one come in, and then the next one, and the next one, and then a whole choir sings the last verse. You hear those different voices joining in. And it's beautiful when it gets to the end. And likewise, we are to live in harmony together. We come together in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And harmony comes because of Jesus. And because we belong to Jesus, we work at it together. 
In the Philippian church, Paul names two women who've worked hard with him, proclaiming the good news of the gospel. And now these two women aren't getting along with each other. We're not told why. But Paul pleads with them. He says, Yodia, Syntyche, please, because you belong to the Lord, settle your disagreement. And he doesn't just speak to them, but he speaks to the others around them. And he says, you help these people come together in unity and in love. It's so important. The psalm that Marion read this morning, I've, I've come to really love that psalm. The psalmist says how good and pleasant it is when we live together in unity. And this is how he describes unity. He describes unity as like a lovely, fragrant oil. The priest is being, being um, set apart for his duty and he's anointed with oil. And unity is like a lovely, fragrant oil. He says unity is like fresh dew descending. It's refreshing. And goes on to say that these are symbols of God's mysterious, life-giving blessings. So much we could say about unity. There's questions like, yes, but what about? What about big faith questions that churches deal with? What about things that can and do divide us? There's not time for that today. And I decided I just wanted to focus on the importance of unity among Christ followers because it's spoken about so much in scripture. God cares about unity. He cares about harmony. It supersedes our preferences and our choices. And our unity, our oneness, our harmony is built on a common foundation that we have in Jesus Christ. If we walk in the light as he in the, is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from every sin. 1 John 1, 7. Jesus said that our love for one another shows the world that we belong to him. Our unity, he says, is also attractive to the world. Jesus prays, may they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me, John 17, 23. I remember a council meeting many years ago when there was differing views on something that we should do. As I recall, it was a bit tense, but we had the best mind, the best in mind for our church. And as, that, as we talked together, we came up with something that wasn't a compromise. It was something that felt right something that was good for all of us, something that was bigger than our individual opinions and ideas alone. Unity comes to us as a gift of God, and it's formed in us through the power of the Holy Spirit. May we be one, just as Jesus and the Father are one, so that the world may know Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for this part, this expression of the body of Christ here at Eyebrow Mennonite Church. What a joy it is to worship together, to live our lives together, to encourage and support each other, and to live in harmonies together for Jesus. Help us when we fail. May our differences, our ideas, and our gifts come together to build something much larger and greater for you than what we could do alone, I pray. Continue to bring us together even more and more that we may be a witness and a testimony to God's love through our love for each other and our unity together. Thank you again, O oh God, for the scriptures that encourage us to be in unity that strongly encourage us to be in unity. And Lord, I pray that we will love each other in a way that when there are differences, we will be able to listen, to really hear each other. And Father, that you will continue to do something about, among us that is bigger than what we could even think of or dream of ourselves. Thank you, O oh God, for your love. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for the work that you continue to do within us. 
We bless you and praise you. Thank you for the week ahead again, O oh God. You know what lies ahead, but we don't. And we pray that as we move into this week, that I thank you that you go ahead of us, and I pray that you will speak to others through us, through our words and through our actions. And O oh God, as we have been blessed, I pray that we may be a blessing to others. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Our benediction comes from Romans 15, verses 5 and 6. May our God, who gives us patience and encouragement, help us to live in complete unity with each other, each with the attitude of Christ toward one another. Then we'll be a choir, not our voices only, but our very lives, singing in harmony in a stunning anthem to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.